If you ever wondered how critical services like load balancers, firewalls or network gateways stay up and running even in the face of failures, you are in the right place. In this video, I'd like to show you how to build a highly available load balancer with KeepAlive D. That will withstand VM failure without the client even noticing. With the rise of the internet and digital technologies, customers have to come to expect uninterrupted access to services they rely on. Whether it's an e-commerce website, a banking application or a cloud-based productivity tool, users expect these services to be available around the clock. Downtime or service interruptions can lead to customer frustration, loss of trust and even financial implications for the business. That's why SRE's focus is on ensuring stability and reliability of a system and developers need to write applications in a way they are resilient to various failures. My name is Philip. Let's get started. We'll start from scratch. As a backend, we'll define a basic HTTP server using the Go programming language. Go is ideal for microservices, network, and system programming. First, we need to import a few packages. Log for logging, net for network operations, uh, net HTTP for HTTP server functionality, OS for operating system related functions, and finally, Gorilla Max for the router. Main is the entry point for our program. First, we create a new router with max new router function. Router allows you to define routes and handle different types of HTTP requests. Next line sets up a route for the root URL. It specifies that when a GET request is made to the root URL, the GET IP address function should be called. HTTP listen and serve starts the HTTP server on port 8080 using the router to handle incoming requests. The server runs indefinitely until an error occurs. Below, we define the get IP address function that will be called when the get request is made to the root URL. It has response and request parameters. Inside get IP address, the split host port function is used to split the IP and port from the remote address of the incoming request. It extracts the IP address of the client, making the request. If there is an error during the address splitting, an HTTP error with the error message is returned. Then we log the IP address to the console. The hostname function is used to get hostname of our server, Finally, a response is written back to the client, including the hostname and the client IP address. In summary, this code sets up a basic HTTP server that listens on port 8080. When a GET request is made to the root URL, it retrieves the client's IP address and server hostname and sends a response containing the hostname and IP address back to the client. Let me show you how our backend service works. I will go to node 1 and start the application. Then, let's call the service from our client machine. Our service did reply with the IP address of the caller. In this case, it's the IP of our client. If we go to node 1, we'll see the request logged. To make the service highly available, let me start the application on node 2 and node 3. Now, our client can call any of the services. It's not very convenient to use a different URL in case of particular node going down. To fix that, let's set up a load balancer in front so we have a single IP that we can use. I'm going to proxy1 and installing AJProxy. If you want to hear more about AJProxy, then here's the video for you. Now, let me open AJProxy's configuration file and add a new frontend of HTTP type. Listening on port 8080, pointing to my server's backend. 
In the backend section, I will define HTTP health check that will use the get method and try a root URI. Now let's define our three nodes as backend servers for our load balancer with health check enabled. Let's reload IJ proxy configuration and check if our backend nodes are operational. We can see all three nodes up. If we look at node 1, node 2 and node 3 logs, we'll see that they are already serving traffic. That's the health check verifying the nodes every second. Let's go to our client machine and try to call the service via proxy one load balancer. Perfect, we got a reply. This time the result is the load balancer IP, as in fact it's the load balancer that is making the request on behalf of the client. Getting back to making the service highly available. Let me stop the application on node 1 and node 2. Now let's check the status on the load balancer. We can see node 1 and node 2 marked as down as those two nodes are failing health checks. Luckily, there is still one more node in operation. Let's go to our client machine and try calling the service. As expected, the service still works and our customers are happy. Let's go one step further. I will go to proxy 1 and stop the load balancing layer. Let's try calling the service one more time. Oh, the service does not work despite still having one more healthy node. What to do next to have a highly available service? Hmm, let's build another load balancer. The plan is to use a second balancer if the first goes down. I'm going to proxy 2 and installing the AJ proxy service. To save time, let's switch to AJ proxy configuration directory and copy the configuration from proxy1. Okay, the file is there. I'm reloading balancer configuration on proxy2 and checking the health of the balancer nodes. Node 3 is showing up. If we look at the logs on node 3, we can see proxy2 health checks probing our service. Let's recover our backend by starting the application on node 1 and node 2 and also starting our balancer on proxy 1. Final check on the balancer health on proxy 1, all up. And proxy 2, all up. Node 1 is responding to health checks from both load balancers. Let me go back to the client and try to call the service via the first load balancer. Works. And now via the second load balancer, also works. Splendid. We can use the second load balancer if the first one fails. Oh wait, although we have service redundancy by having multiple backend nodes and load balancer redundancy by having two load balancers, we still rely on the client to point to a different load balancer in case of issues. We finally reached the topic of this video. We want to make the load balancer fault tolerant, highly available, and we don't want the client to make any changes. To do this, we'll make proxy1 and proxy2 share a virtual IP address. One server will be acting as a master and other as a backup. Master will be responsible for handling traffic and backup will be monitoring the status of the master. If the master becomes unavailable, the backup will be elected as new master. Whoever is the master exposes the virtual IP. Moreover, the virtual IP address remains constant so that our client don't have to make any configuration changes during failover. The process is fully automatic and ensures uninterrupted network connectivity. It will use VRRP that stands for Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol. There can be more than one backup server, so VRRP uses multicast for communication. All servers are part of the same multicast group. The master periodically sends updates to the group and all servers listen for updates. If the backup server stops hearing from the master for a specific period, it assumes the master had failed and initiates a failover process to become the new master. 
first thing we need to do is check if our network supports multicast traffic. Please in mind that most cloud environments do not natively support multicast. I will go to proxy1 and run the omping command. You need to put your local IP first and then the destination IP. Next, let's run the same command on proxy2. What will happen is both servers will join the same multicast group. You can check which multicast group the server belongs to with IPM address show. Or netstat-g. OMPing will listen on UDP port 4321 on both unicast and multicast addresses. OMPing will send a probe to both unicast and multicast addresses. Let me show you probes by dumping the traffic with TCP dump. Let's go to proxy1 and stop the test. There are zero unicast packet lost and zero multicast packet lost. That means our network support both unicast and multicast traffic. Next step is to install KeepAliveD on proxy1 and also install KeepAliveD on proxy2. This service will make our servers highly available. Let's open KeepAliveD configuration file. In the global definition section, I'm setting the VRRP flavor to 3. There's also older version 2 of the protocol. Version 3 supports IPv6, more advanced authentication, extended priority range, uh, more flexibility in advertisements intervals, and has few other options. Let's also enable the max auto priority option to get rid of the warning in the logs. Now I'm defining our VRRP instance. Let's name it instance one. We are on proxy one, so let's set it to be the master. Now let's specify ETH1 as the interface for the Keep Alive D to run on. Let's specify which router ID the instance belongs to. For the routers to form a group, they need to have the same router ID. In our case, we'll set the router ID to one on both servers. Please mind that you can have multiple VRRP instances on the same server as long as the router ID is different. Let's set the priority to 100. During election, the router with highest priority becomes the master. Let's set one second as the time between router advertisements. Finally, let's set our virtual IP to dot 100. I will perform the same configuration on proxy 2. Only difference will be setting the initial state of keep alive D as backup and not master and also setting up lower priority. Proxy1 has a higher priority of 100, so every time it's available, it will be elected as master. Now let's restart keep alive D on proxy1. In the logs, we can see it started successfully and entered master state. Let's start the other cluster node that is proxy2 and check its logs. It started in backup state. Master node was assigned a virtual IP of .100. The MAC address for the interface ends with 22. Keep Alive D joined a multicast group 2240018. That's the group the master will publish its updates. Let me show you how such an update looks with TCP dump. VRRP update has the router ID, priority, and the virtual IP. You can also dump the traffic by specifying protocol 112, as 112 is VRRP. Let's do some testing. First, I will ping the virtual IP from the client. Works. Let's try calling our service via the virtual IP. Works. If we check the ARP cache on the client, the virtual IP MAC address ends with 22. That's uh, the hardware address of our ETH1 interface on proxy1. Let me prepare traffic captures on proxy2 and client so that I can show you what happens during failover. On proxy2, that is the backup node, I will run TCP dump of VRRP traffic. On the client, I will perform a traffic dump of ARP protocol. All is set. Let's bring the ETH1 interface on proxy1 down. 
See what happened. Proxy2 emitted a gratuitous ARP stating that the MAC address of the virtual IP has changed and now ends with 27. Previously it was 22. This is necessary to update the ARP cache of the switch and the client so that if they try to connect to the virtual IP, they will go to a new MAC. If we look at the VRRP traffic, Proxy1 with priority 100 stopped sending updates and Proxy2 with priority 50 started sending updates. It was the moment of the failover. If we look at the Keep Alive D logs, Proxy2 claimed the master role. With the master role, it did assign the virtual IP to ETH1 interface. Mind that the MAC address of ETH1 interface ends with 27 and not with 22 as it was on Proxy1. If we go back to the client and check its ARP cache, we discover it already points to the new MAC address. This is thanks to the gratuitous ARP it received earlier. Let's check if our service still works. Everything is good. Now let's go back to our failed node and check the logs. We see that ETH1 interface is down and the VRRP is in fault state. Let's bring the interface up and check the logs again. Proxy1 was elected the master. If we check the logs on Proxy2, we can see it was downgraded to backup state. The message clearly indicates that Proxy2 received an update from Proxy1 stating it has higher priority. Let's check the ARP cache on the client. The virtual IP MAC address was updated back to 22. Of course, the service still works, but the traffic goes via proxy one. There's one last thing I'd like to show you. What if we shut down the HA proxy load balancer process on the active node? Although the virtual IP is up on the master, the service is down. There's a way for the keep alive D to check the status of underlying HA proxy service and if the service is down, to mark the virtual IP also down. Let me show you how to do it. I will start AJ proxy and open the keep alive configuration file. For simplicity, I'll be running the checks as a root that is not recommended. For that to work, I will add the enable script security option and specify the user that will be running the check. Now let's define a script that will be executed to check if AJ proxy is running. There are better ways to do it, but we will use killall-0. If the process is running, it will return 0. If the process is not running, it will return a non-zero result. Let's also specify how often to run the check in seconds. How many checks to consider the service down and how many checks to consider the service up. Finally, I will add this script as so-called track script of our instance one. Let's restart keep alive D and check the logs. The VRRP check was successful. Just in case, I'll test the service from our client. Everything is looking good. Now let's bring our AJ proxy down and check keep alive D logs. Our script that checks AJ proxy process did return a non-zero value and the keep alive D instance entered fault state. This caused the proxy to take over the master role. Our service is still available, but this time it goes via the second balancer. If we bring back AJ proxy service, the check script will be successful and our proxy1 will resume operation as master. 